I, I want you to go with me to Matthew 14 and verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But Jesus straightway spake unto them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Not everything that you think hell sent and not everything you thought was something else might be the Lord showing up saying, this is me. Don't be afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. He said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried and said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. I want to preach on being caught. Push on your neighbor and say, thank God I got caught. <laughs> I got caught. You ever just had to tell somebody they caught me? I was right in the middle of it. I'm telling you right now, I got caught. You will never have another caught until Jesus catches you. <laughs> and you could say, he caught me. He caught me. I want to preach on that for a few moments today. Father, we bless you and thank you for everything that has transpired. Thank you, Lord, for the flow and the rhythm of service and how you do what you do and orchestrate it to me is amazing. Thank you, God, for the goodness that we feel in the atmosphere. Thank you for your blessings and your goodness and your kindness. Father, I pray for your precious people that, God, you will help me to reach at maximum potential everybody that's here, that I will say something that will impact somebody. But, God, in totality, everybody will be blessed. And, Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, let everybody say amen, amen. and amen. Let's give God some praise as we... As it is our custom to praise God for the reading of the word. Come on, everybody. You know, it's amazing to see Jesus do miraculous things and people call it something else. Uh, they called it a spirit. And I've got to wonder in my heart in Matthew chapter number 15 when the story begins to unfold that we see a series of events. I've got to wonder, were they already afraid? When the winds hit, for the Bible says the winds were contrary, I've got to speculate in my mind, not assume, but just speculate a little bit, and maybe some assumption that perhaps they were already afraid, and then when they saw a figure come walking on the water, they started to assume because of the fear that was already in existence uh, this has to be some sort of spirit. Or if you start to really dive, define, and break the word down, a phantom. That's what the word ends up being when they called it a spirit like that. So they must have already been dealing with something, and they're already dealing with something, and then Jesus shows up, and they start calling it something else. And they say, that must be this, or that must be something else. I, I love when Jesus shows up in the middle of our mess and surprises us with his presence. Because we start calling everything around us evil and everything bad and nothing good can come out of this, but I love that his timing is impeccable. And uh, you'll have to excuse me because I just feel like diving right into the preaching of the word of God. There's no lead up, there's no build up. I'm going right into the story because I feel like I'm on a mission today. Some people are going to need to hear what I believe that God has given me. It's the fourth watch of the night, and I want to break this down, and I want us to have a teaching moment because I want you to get this. I don't want us to call everything because we're going through a bad time or we're going through a turbulent season to call everything that comes at us bad because I want you to understand that your fiery trials attract the Lord. There's something about the fire when Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego went in. It was at the time 
that the fire or furnace was heated up seven times that the, the fourth man showed up. So I want you to understand God is attracted to your trial. Those of you that are going through difficulty right now, those of you that have a tempest surrounding you, trials all about you, I want you to know he is attracted to you. I mean, it's difficult sometimes to reach people when they have an egotistical, self-confident mindset, self-righteous, and all that indignation settles in and you get up here on the mountain and think like, I got all this. It's hard to reach people like that. It's hard to help them ascertain the understanding of what we're going through because they're so high-minded up there on that, and that high altitude. But I'm telling you, it's when you get down in the valley that you begin to pray like you've never prayed before. It's when you get down in the valley that you have a dependence on God like you've never had before. When you get down in the valley, you understand, I can't dig myself out of this one. I can't bring myself out of this. All I can do is have a great trust that God is going to show up and get me out of here. So if you don't mind, let me just preach right away. From anywhere to three to six o'clock in the morning, he shows up. Three o'clock saying that's about that time, but it could have been anywhere thereafter. So you know three o'clock in the morning is dark. And when you're out there by yourself and you're on a boat and you've been pushed out and he says go to the other side and then he sends the multitude away and then he goes to praying, you know it's a dark time. And no doubt they're probably already fearful because here comes the wind and the waves and they can't see and it's probably not the right time to go sailing at night or in the early morning hours like that. But nonetheless, they went because the son of God said go. And here they are in a mess. And I'm telling you, saints of God, it's when the enemy gets you cornered. It's when the enemy gets you at a dark moment of your life. It's when the enemy gets you with everybody else you've been accustomed to hanging out with, but yet they all collectively have the same spirit you have that you've got to deal with. And it's at that point in time that they all begin to recognize because the Bible said, in other words, if you read the scripture, they screamed and they cried for fear. That's what they did. When they saw Jesus come and didn't recognize him for who that he is, they begin to scream out in fear of what was going on. Have you ever been there in your life when the Son of God is so close to you, but yet fear still exists? Let me tell you something, the closer he gets, the further fear has to go. The closer he gets, the further problems have to flee. The closer he gets, the further your mindset of I'm going under has to dissipate because when the presence of God hits the house and the presence of God comes close to your trial, when the presence of God comes close to your boat, let me tell you something, saints of God, I'm not here to talk you out of it. I'm here to preach to your very soul and spirit that God has not lost any power that his son is still ready and available to touch your knee right where you are. Cherry means opposed as in character or purpose, completely different. The word contrary, it caused the problem. The, the, the word that everything was contrary, that's what caused it. It wasn't the sea, it was the wind that hit it that caused the topsy-turvy and the mess that was going on around them. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt like in your life that Jesus has sent you away? And then once he pushed you off, then he sends the multitude away. And you're wondering, why is it, Lord, that you have to be separated from me? Why is it, Lord, that you have shoved me out into difficulty while you go up there and pray? And I wrestled with this because I thought to myself, would I rather have him with me or would I rather have him praying for me? I, I have had to struggle with this decision as a pastor. Does that family want me to be with them in the room or do they want me to be in my prayer closet calling on the Lord right now? It is a win-win when you get to praying. And so if he was simply there with them, um, it would have been easy for them to say, Jesus, can you fix this? But sometimes what the Lord does is he creates space between me and him. And when that happens, it causes me to trust him more than I've ever trusted him in my life. Now, I know I'm preaching to everybody right now because you're taking mental notes and you're taking physical with paper notes with a pen. 
and you're saying something along the lines is sometimes Jesus will leave you by yourself. Not to just create space, but to produce faith. Sometimes there's some space between you and him because he wants you to understand that you've got to be dependent on me whether you feel me and see me or whether you don't. We need to understand that God is up to something in the midst of our trials. We need to understand that God is up to stump something when the winds get contrary. You got to understand that God is up to something when people get contrary. I have never lived in my lifetime in a place where when I pastor, people are more contrary than they are now. They will turn on you. They will unfriend you. They will talk about you. They will stab your back. They will run you down. They will tell all your secrets. You can't tell them anything or they'll run and tell their best friend and their best friend's got a best friend and they get to telling them and y'all know what I'm preaching about right here. I'm telling you saints of God, the longer I live, the more I understand. Can't nobody do you like Jesus. Can't nobody keep a secret like him. Can't nobody love you like him. Can't nobody keep you like Jesus can. I learned a long time ago I can't put my hope in people, not in preachers, not in pastors, not in politicians, not in theologians, not in doctors, because they can't fix everything, not in nurse practitioners, not in the medical field. And I appreciate all of the above, but let me tell you something. The longer I live, the longer I've learned, I've got to put my trust in the Lord because there will be times when Jesus pushes you out in the boat and turns his back on you and walks up into the mountain to pray for you. Let me tell you something. These are trying times, but God has not forgotten you. You might think Jesus is up in some mountain somewhere. When you ever going to come down here, he will be there at the right time. But the reason he's creating distance is not for you to stress out, but it's for him to build your faith up to another level. Nothing will build your faith more than having to sit into a boat filled with people that have like faith and like commonality with you and unity. And all of you be in the same boat at the same time facing the struggle, but yet there's so much distance between you and the Lord. Nothing will build your faith that when you sit in a boat and have no exit plan, this is it. This is the only thing that's gonna take us across. I am sitting in my lifeline. I've got no life jacket. I've got no plan. And B, I got nowhere else to go. Is there anybody inside redemption on this live stream right now that understands you will get in a place in your life where when all you have is what you're sitting on? I can't get a doctor out here, I can't get a word out here, I can't feel like I can pray out here, but somehow you know that somewhere in the midst of time and my struggle, he is gonna show up. Anybody glad to know that when he shows up, he's always right on why is he doing this to me where's he at where is he right now I'm out here struggling and uh, he's up there praying he's in the mountain and all my people's gone all my people that a few hours ago we were laughing, cutting up and getting healed and getting blessed. And there were prayer lines and Jesus was laying hands on people. And now he sent us away. He sent us away from him. And I know it's getting quiet in here because you cannot ascertain in your fleshly, natural mind why Jesus would do us that way, but he still does. Sometimes you feel like he walks away for just a moment. And I can't feel God. And don't sit there like you're so saved and beyond any problematic circumstances or trials. That you tell me every minute of your living life, I feel the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm glad you're so superman, superwoman, spiritual. But I don't know about you, but there are times I feel like, where in the world are you at, Jesus? What in the world is going on in my life? I can't seem to get a prayer through. 
and life is contrary right now and things are happening that I don't understand and I don't know why you would be over there when I'm right here messed up but always right in the midst of time even more things start to show up and you think that's the enemy and sometimes let me tell you in the midst of your adversity Jesus shows up to surprise you not to scare you he shows up to let you know I knew what you were going through I knew what was going on I was up there praying and I felt like I need to get to my people let me tell you when it looks like the boat is about to capsize it's right about the time that God always I know it's a little teaching moment right here. And I know we're not swinging from the lights and ain't nobody hanging off projectors. But is there anybody willing to just get up out of your seat and run up here and just tap this altar area and say, I need him to show up right now. If he don't show up, I'm going to capsize. If he don't show up, I don't know what I'm going to do. If he don't show up, I don't know how I'm going to make it. If he don't show up, this thing is going under. Woo! Come on, don't kill it, just touch it. <laughs> well, go on and help yourself, I guess. Can I get a witness in the house? is starting to shift in the atmosphere someone just understood the fact is he don't ever let you go all the way under he don't ever leave you out there like that push your neighbor and say isn't he faithful doesn't he always show up right on time doesn't he know exactly what you need when you need it doesn't he always come through doesn't he always Can I just say something real quick? Stop being so surprised when Jesus shows up. They got to the point that when the answer started walking toward them, they started screaming for fear. These bunch of grown men, disciples, started screaming for fear. So right away, that allows me the boldness and courage to look at you with my feet flat, my eyes open, and hand in a microphone with a Bible unfolded before me and tell you, you're not always going to have life perfect. You're not always going to have extreme impeccabilities all around you. There's times you're going to struggle, and there's times you're going to feel like he's up some mountain, but he's right there. But he's right there. Stop sh shouting, what is it? Stop saying, who is it? And then Peter recognized who he, I hate to say who he was. Peter recognized who he is. When Peter recognized who he is and all his frailties and extrovert personality that always says something, you know, the guy that pulls the sword and cuts off ears. That's him. Guy that's always saying, Lord, shouldn't we do something about this here that's going on? I mean, he's always saying something. He's an extrovert. He's always got something to say. He stands up in the boat and said, Lord, if that's you, let me come to you. And Jesus, why? 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 Number one, let me say this. Good job, Brother Peter. Because you just expressed in that statement how close we should want to be with Jesus every time he shows up. Let me go on to say this, no matter the storm, no matter the tempest, no matter the wind, no matter the waves, no matter the ocean, no matter the separation, no matter the problematic circumstance between you and him, you should always want to stand up and say, if that's you, I'm coming over. I don't care what this looks like. I don't care what we've been doing. I don't care how I acted. I'm at the point in my life where I'm sick of this boat, this mess, and this destructive circumstance. I mean, I'm ready to come to you. Something ought to get up in your soul every time you sense he's near something ought to get up on the inside of you and say no matter what's between you and him you get yourself up and walk get there to him where he is oh, 
I don't want you to come here and try to get close to me. And I don't mind that with all due respect. But I want you to come here and have a hunger to get close to him. I don't want you to come here just because it's an easy off and on I-75, two mile journey off the highway to get here. Two right turns or a few turns, if you will, depending on where you park. I want you to come here because Jesus is in this house. I want you to come here because I've been through some hell and high water and the winds are contrary and my family has written me off and the world has written me off and I don't know if I'm ever going to come up for air. I'm about to go under, but I know if I can get to him, it's going to be all right. And whatever it is between me and him, I'm going for it. I am going for it. Let me just preach a little bit more right here to the edge. I'm about to build me something where I can go out a little closer. But while I'm here, let me just tell you, you ought to say no matter what is going on in my life, Jesus, do you mind if I come over to you? Uh, This thing of being where your people ain't working, I just need to get to you. Do you mind? I don't mind crawling over waves and wind and I don't care about all the stuff I've had to go through. I just want to touch you. I want to be close to you. I want to be where you are. Man, forget your choir and your preacher. How about you get close to Jesus how about you run to him can I keep on preaching come out from under religious protocol (laughs) come out from under programs and ritualistic ideas religiously that have led you to the place where you are bound and broke and and cannot get free. Get out of it. Just get to Jesus. To everyone in this tabernacle, I don't know your dilemma. I don't know your struggles. But I know a man who can take you right how you are. I know a man that can bring you from fearful of I'm going to die and capsize in this boat to one moment later, can I just come to you? Do you mind if I just touch you? Do you mind if I... They knew about that woman with the issue of blood. They knew about the lepers he had cleansed. They knew about the blind eyes he opened and the thousands he fed. He knew about Jairus' daughter. They must have known what he'd done and what he was going to do. Saints of God, I'm telling you, they knew. I got to get close to him. You know why you need to deal with redemption forget about an altar necessarily and just know that by your faith of walking up by your faith of just giving a push that he is going to meet you there come on come on push on your neighbor push on your neighbor tell him I got to get to him I got to get to him. And I'm not talking about my pastor. I'm talking about Jesus. I got to get to him. This ain't working with these disciples. That, that boat ain't working. I need to get to him. Sometimes your church can't do it. Sometimes your fellowship with the hierarchy can't do it. Sometimes you've got to position yourself in a place where I just need him. If I could just touch him, I would be all right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We put so much pressure on pastors and preachers as if they walk on water and they hung the moon and they put the stars and they put the sun and they made it so if it gets close, we burn up and fur away and we freeze up. We put so much pressure on them. Listen, all I have, all I have is what Paul said. I am what I am by the grace of God. All I have is Jesus on the inside, still working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Hallelujah. All I know is I pressed through the crowd, reached up and touched Jesus. Southern gospel's coming out of me right now. Hallelujah. Oh, I thank you, Jesus. Thank God all we have is him. When you've searched through your directory, when you've gone through your Facebook friends and called the prayer line, when you put in every request, all you have at the end of the day is an old 
boat that's about to capsize with a bunch of God's people. And if I don't get to him, I'm not going to make it. I just wish you knew it was about getting to him. Would anybody stand up inside this tabernacle and tell a couple of people around you if you could just get to him? High five a couple of people around you. And I'm going to try to bring us in for a landing. Looks like I'll have you on the ground in 12 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. It's 87 degrees and partly cloudy in Dayton, Ohio. We'll have you out that door in just a few moments. Hallelujah. In the meantime, let me preach about being caught. Caught. The greatest picture to me, the Lord started laying this message on my heart. And when I looked at it, I literally scrapped 90% of the notes I had on this message, got rid of it. And I began to pull from everything that God kept showing me in this story. First of all, the greatest picture of grace. You will hear me talk about grace often. Not as, you, not as much as you do some TV preachers that that's all they talk about. It's what we all call hyper grace. That you can do everything you want to and then still claim the grace of God. That's a bad spirit. That's like being in a marriage and reminding your wife after you've messed up on her 55 times in two months. Grace baby, grace baby. She gonna knock the fire out of you too. And, and then she gonna hook. Then she gonna find your 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 side piece. <laughs> oh, you got you got a kick out of that. Then she gonna find your hoochie mama, and she gonna rip her weave out. Or, or for you white people, she gonna grab them extensions, and she gonna swing her around. She gonna swing her so hard them big old eyelashes that come clear out to here that scratch that forehead. She gonna rip them out too. Y'all get grace now. Y'all get grace. Okay, we gonna edit. God, I got security standing up now. <laughs> uh, uh, stand up, please. <laughs> Pastor is gonna get a book thrown at him. Thank you. Let me tell you about grace. Grace is when you love him. Grace is when you wanna be with him. Grace says, I'm sorry, Lord, I, I did not believe like I should have. Lord, I'm sorry I've been in this boat and I just followed along with all your other disciples and was screaming like they were. God, I'm, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Can I come and see you? I got to touch you. And Jesus said, come. And Peter stepped out of the boat and starts walking on the water. And it was about the time that he got his eyes off the Lord and he got focused on what was going on around him. And Jesus knew it. And Jesus went over and caught him. I don't believe Brother Peter ever went under. I believe he was on his way under in a bad circumstance. And Jesus caught him. I'm just going to stand here. And I'm going to take my emotion out of this. I'm going to do my best. I can't make any promises, but I'm going to do my best. Is anybody glad that you were where you should be? A few minutes ago, you were screaming because you were afraid. But somehow, Jesus shows up, and you're grateful. And you say to him, Lord, can, can I come out there? You just messed up a few minutes ago by not believing that he's going to take care of you in the boat. You just saw everything he did today. And by three o'clock in the morning, you've lost all faith. And there you are. And you mess up again. You're literally that close to him. And you get your eyes to look in other places. Man, come on. I can't tell you how many times I get in a Bible study and I'm getting close to the Lord and I feel the spirit and I'm reminded of something and start checking my phone right in the middle of God doing something for me in his word. I can't tell you how many times I've been, oh, 
God, I thank you, Jesus, and I give you praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yeah, I did forget to do that and stop and write something down. And then I have to say, God, I'm really sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me. And I'm not blaming it on ADD. Come on, can I just preach to you? Old brother Peter knew. When Jesus said, come, it meant go. But his eyes got shifty. Anybody ever had a shifty eye problem? It's why Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I will not sin against God. I don't know if Job could look in the future and see these handheld devices we have that show us everything we want to see at any given point in time. But he said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Hallelujah. That went over great. I'm just asking you the question. I'm just asking you. Okay. I'm going to hit all y'all today. Is anybody thankful that when you just got wiped off, that you just got dusted off, you just got another chance at it, and you walked out there that close to the Lord, and you started looking around at everything around you instead of continuing to trust him, that he didn't stand there and ditch you and say, get what you deserve and have it your way, brother Peter. You're always talking, always saying something. Now have fun going under because you're about to die. Instead of doing that, he walked over and caught him. That is nothing but the grace of God. That is nothing but the grace of God. I can't help it. I'm trying to take my motion out of it, but I can't now. There ought to be a whole lot more people standing up right now saying, thank God he caught me one more time. Thank God he caught me. Tell somebody else next to you, thank God he caught me. He caught me. To me, caught means two things. (laughs) Number one, he caught me looking somewhere else. Number two, he caught me getting afraid again. Number three, he caught me getting scared. Number four, he caught me losing my focus. Number five, he caught me being concerned again. But last but not least, the best caught is the grace of God. When he walked over, in spite of all my catches, he caught me. He said, I got you. Let me tell you something. You never know what a hand feels like until you've been like me. And got caught in some rocks when I was about eight years old. My head went under. I lost direction of where I was. I started swallowing water, started going up my nose, my foot stuck and caught, and water that was over my head and underneath stuck, and all I could do was reach, and my uncle grabbed my hand, yanked me up, held me in the air, said, you okay? You don't know how it feels to get your breath back. You don't know how it feels to have another chance. You don't know how it feels when you thought this is it. Is there anybody in this place that you thought all this other stuff was good enough? But Jesus showed up. I know what I'm preaching. Because because my family's been a mess, but my mama's in heaven. My daddy's saved. And the rest of my family, one by one, you are coming in, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you're coming in. He caught me. He caught me. There's a man that must be 52 years old by now, maybe 53. There's a man somewhere in the United States that needs to look me up and thank me 
because I was in a swimming pool and I happened to look across and see him at the bottom of the pool. And I swam underwater as fast as I could and I grabbed him and I swam up to the top and his mom screaming at the edge of the water and I swam him over. And I think it was probably about that time that said, you're gonna be a good preacher because <laughs> you're going after people on the bottom. You know what the Lord is saying today? Thank God. Thank God that he gave us another chance. Anybody, anybody know the, the, the freedom and the liberty of somebody giving you another chance? You know how it feels to not notice the speed limit sign and be flying because you're listening to gospel music and you're doing the same speed limit you were doing five miles back, but it went from 70 to 55. And 72 is really bad. And the police pull you over. And they say, do you know how fast you were going? And you don't be smart eloquently and say, you know how fast you were going to catch me? That's not a good time to say that. And you look at them and say, well, I, my Bible's in the back and I was listening to gospel music. I, I, I've been doing this for 20 miles. Well, it changed. And him just hand your license back and pat you on the back and say, you slow down because I don't want you to hit a deer. I said, oh, I sure will. Thank you, Jesus. He caught me. But then he caught me. Come on. And he let you go. Come on, saints. How many's thankful that he, he caught you? How many's thankful you were doing your own thing, but he caught you? He caught you. He caught you. I want us to stand together all over this church. The power of God has been here this morning. And as we approach noon and now have, I want you to understand that the power of God is resting in this place to show you a picture of his grace and his mercy. A picture of you were fallen and he's the only one that can catch you.